Our first speaker is Patrick Lamson Hall. Patrick is an economist and policy analyst with the Sahel and West Africa Club at the OECD and principal and founder of Fitted Projects, a boutique urban design and architecture firm. Prior to joining the OECD, Patrick was a research scholar with the Marin Institute and is a PhD candidate in public administration at the Wagner School of Public Service here at NYU. Thanks everyone, that's probably the most applause someone's ever gotten for being a PhD candidate. Um, so thanks, I, I hope everyone enjoyed your lunch. Um, I know that we all just ate and the morning was long, so I'll try to be interesting, but um, to be perfectly honest, I changed my presentation after seeing Astrid's presentation this morning. So I, I come at this topic of new cities from a few different angles. Um, I come at it from the research that I've done with Professor Sally Angel on urban growth in Africa, the work that we've done together on the ground in Ethiopia, Uganda, Somaliland, Colombia, uh, working with cities to help them prepare for their urban growth, working with the public sector uh, to help cities prepare for their urban growth. And then I come at it from this, this private sector angle of uh, working with developers and nonprofits like CCI that are actually interested in, um, in, in the charter city idea, in new cities as real estate developments, in new cities as as public-private partnerships. Uh, so, so I have a lot of hats, and this presentation in some way is like if I took all those hats and put them in a blender and then tried to make a new hat. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about urban population growth and the context that we face, which is something that a lot of people have alluded to, and I'll just put some numbers on it quickly. Um, then I'm going to tell about the the core work of helping cities prepare for urban expansion with the public sector. And then I wanna talk a bit about how private sector and nonprofit efforts can become involved in these things. And I think there is a role for the private sector and nonprofits in these things, simply because the public sector activity is so lacking. I was talking to uh, Solly earlier and, uh, and just mentioned that you know, in the 10 years that we've been working on this, doing urban expansion planning, the uptake has been amazing. People are very excited about this idea. They like it and they know it and they use it. But in the end, we maybe have worked with 30, 30 cities directly out of something like 500 that actually need this. So uh, the challenge when you're working with public sector entities is that the incentives to scale and to grow are, are less than when you're um, activating markets and working with the private sector. So uh, without any more introduction, um, here's some context. Uh, we come to this topic of new cities in a world of very rapid urban growth. Uh, my favorite headline statistic right now is for every one new urban resident in a more developed country, 18 people will move to a city in a less developed country in the next 30 years. So urban growth fundamentally right now is a phenomenon that's taking place in Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Central Asia, and I mean urban population growth. Uh, we're looking to add about 2.3 billion people, which is um, quite a lot. And in many countries, that means that their urban population is gonna more than double. Um, it's especially important uh, when we think about who's moving to cities. So uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, three-fifths or so of the population growth is from births in urban areas. These are like people being born in urban areas, but two-fifths is from rural urban migration. And rural urban migrants who are moving to cities, for one thing, people who are doing private new city developments in, uh, in developing countries should see these people as their clients, right? The people who actually need new floor space in cities. And uh, they move to cities for many different reasons. I mean, economic activity, quality of life, better services, uh, extra income. Some of them are traders who manage rural urban linkages. Others are forcibly displaced. They have a, a huge profile, but the truth is they're very different in general than the people who are often targeted for new city projects. People who are targeted as residents in new city projects tend to be upper income, white collar, often internationally connected, sometimes knowledge workers. 
but this population doesn't represent the majority of population growth in cities. So if we're thinking about new cities as a solution to the challenge of urbanization, we have to be thinking about ways of building new cities that actually can meet these people's needs. Uh, and uh, you know, just an important consideration there is that this population growth is leading to spatial expansion with or without planning. So when cities grow in population, they also increase in area. We have the example of Accra here, which increased 6.1 times in area, 3.4 times in population. Um, this is fairly typical. As cities double in population, they triple in area on average. New residents of cities can settle in existing areas, which is called densification, or they can settle in newly built areas, which is called urban expansion, and worldwide, um, about three quarters of urban population growth is landing in areas of expansion. Uh, in Accra, it was about 75%, almost exactly. So when we consider planning for new cities, we should start by recognizing that most new cities won't be greenfield projects. They, they'll be extensions or edge cities. And this is actually, in a way, a good thing because that's what makes urban development economically feasible. Uh, by building adjacent to existing cities, you can piggyback on their metropolitan labor markets. Uh, more importantly, you can piggyback on their connective infrastructure, airports, highways, ports. Uh, and um, when considering where, I would really encourage people looking to develop new city projects to expand their lens beyond the internationally connected major cities that are often the focus of these efforts to the 414 secondary cities that have more than 100,000 residents in sub-Saharan Africa and have hosted 54% of urban population growth. These are places where um, they're, they're cities of arrival for new migrants. 90% uh, of the population of sub-Saharan Africa lives within 100 kilometers of a secondary city. Um, they're cheaper. They're better connected to rural areas, and they're places that have the most growth potential if you're interested in doing a project at scale, because practically speaking, that's where, um, that's where governments are attentive and where it's possible to get land, and the number of actors are minimized. The way this growth is occurring right now, or at least as we studied it in the Atlas of Urban Expansion from, say, 1990 to 2015, um, we, we observed that about two-thirds of newly built residential areas didn't have any planning at all. So I'm not talking about no new city plans. I'm talking about no private sector plans, no public sector plans. There was no framework that this growth took place in. And this is very problematic because, as, as Astrid pointed out, when these areas grow with no plans, eventually they need to be retrofitted with infrastructure and the cost of furnishing unplanned areas with infrastructure is three to seven times more than doing it in areas that were planned. So in other words, every time a city grows without a plan, the government is essentially incurring a debt that it will have to pay later to service that area with infrastructure. It's, a, it's like a running infrastructure deficit that gets bigger all the time. So I say this as an aside, uh, when people talk about redevelopment of existing areas and prioritizing that over urban expansion, we should be clear that what they're really talking about is making that debt bigger. Um, so uh, there have been, there are private sector responses to this, uh, and the responses have been insufficient. Most new city projects fail to meet the, the need for peripheral urban development. They're not at the right scale. Um, they're not at the right income. And um, also the informal private sector response is insufficient in various ways. We, we can see a really sharp contrast here. I mean, this is Kalamba. I think Kalamba gets picked on a lot because there are a lot of photographs of it, but I'm gonna pick on it as well. Um, so in Kalamba, the cheapest unit costs 70,000 US, but that's after a $50,000 government subsidy, right? That's to live in this community. And uh, the GDP per capita in Angola is $1,895 a year. So these units are profoundly out of reach. Now, Barrio Rangel, which is in the same city, um, also a private sector development in the sense that it's being built by private individuals through private efforts. You could say this is not a public sector 
effort over here. It's, it's a private sector effort. Um, informal private sector development offers a range of housing sizes and styles. Many are self-built at prices that newcomers can afford. But when we look at this from a planning perspective, uh, we can see that the formal private sector is capable of producing planned cities with adequate provision of basic services, but it's totally homogenous. There's almost no room for other actors and people can't afford it. Now, the informal private sector actually can create housing and floor space at a scale and level of affordability that matches the population growth that's happening in these cities. So in a basic sense, this doesn't solve a problem. This solves a problem, right? These people are housed now. Um, and if we were relying on this, they wouldn't be. Uh, it has low barriers to entry, but it can't provide basic services or key public goods. So from a long-term wealth creation perspective or a long-term value creation perspective, Kilamba and the new cities that are like it are stagnant. There's no room in this city for low-income residents or grassroots entrepreneurs, and it's because the developer had a very fixed vision of what a city should be. Barrio Rangel also has trouble with long-term value creation because it doesn't have the things that let value accrue over time, like improved connections to the labor market, robust urban layouts, basic services, title and tenure. Now we know that investments in public goods can generate huge increases in land value when they're paired with an urban economic understanding of cities. Um, and this is usually seen as a kind of a public sector activity, but in Africa it's not happening. So the question we can ask ourselves is, is there room for private entrepreneurs to create a business model that provides the same accessibility and participation and inclusion that we see in Barrio Rangel, but with provision of public goods like we see in Colomba. And to, to me, that's an open question, but I think considering the public sector deficits that are very obvious, that's the direction that, that we need to move in. We need to be able to, we need to come up with strategies to mobilize private sector capital to meet the needs of low-income residents. Uh, just a, an observation here. I, by the way, I should say I really did rework this presentation, so each slide is as much a surprise to me as it is to you. Um, the, the kind of urban planning that these places need is, is lightweight and proactive. Um, it's basically about ensuring that in the long term, when the upgrading process takes place, it takes place in a way that's affordable and again lets it happen at scale. So, you know, these are images kind of contrasting of opening up a road in a rural area before development occurs. This is a very simple road, you know, um, and trying to open up a road in an area that's already built up. You can imagine the difficulty involved in opening up a road in a place that's already built up versus in a place that's not. So we, we need to be proactive and we also need to be inclusive. And when we think about inclusive design, we can start from a few basic principles that aren't usually associated with it. Um, the first one is to understand that cities are labor markets. So designing neighborhoods for low-income people that don't provide access to jobs really fundamentally doesn't work. We have to meet this labor market need in order to have land values in any case. The second thing to understand is that um, the urban economy scales based on the number of jobs. People come to cities mainly to sell their labor, and when there are more buyers for that labor, the price can be higher, the productivity can be higher, the opportunities for learning, matching, and agglomeration can be greater. And the greater the number of jobs accessible within a given commuting radius, or the greater number of workers accessible to firms, the greater will be the output of the city. In other words, when we think about planning cities and planning for city growth, we have to understand that the thing that creates prosperity isn't the population or the number of jobs. It's the number of potential connections within the commuting radius. That's what makes it happen. So this is a, this is a fundamental principle of urban design that's, that's very important. Third, uh, non-excludable public infrastructure networks are the things that connect labor market actors. I'm, and that's a very fancy way of saying, if there aren't any roads to a piece of land, the people don't want that piece of land. And if you were living on a piece of land with poor connectivity, it wouldn't have a very high value, it wouldn't be good for you. So we need to have these non-excludable public infrastructure networks, road networks essentially, in order to have value creation in cities. These don't have to look like things that are used for cars, they can be bike paths, bus routes, whatever, but they have to tie the city together. Um, 
Then we have this idea of evolution, which is completely missing from the Colombo model. To build a city that's actually inclusive, that actually works like a real city and that has long-term value creation, we have to recognize that especially in a rapidly urbanizing context, the economy is changing very fast, very dynamic changes in the economy. Households and firms are changing and uh, households change in composition and income, firms change in size and competitiveness. This means that demand curves change. Demand curves specifically for land, housing, grocery stores, all types of floor space. So however the city's designed, uh, it has to be designed in a way that makes the supply of floor space elastic so that it can actually respond to these changes that are happening. And then, uh, this is just my own aside, a project that just focuses on one income segment really has no business calling itself a city by any means. Like uh, a project that focuses on one income segment is, is dependent on other things going on around it in order to thrive. That means that when you have an area that's for upper income people, it is implying an area that's occupied by low income people that has a worse quality of life and worse services. When you have an area where you're prohibiting commercial establishments and industry, it is assuming that that activity is gonna be going on somewhere else. A city includes the range of activities that are necessary for an urban economy to function. And when we think about urban growth and especially in new city models, if we're thinking at scale, we need to be building places that can incorporate the entire range of activities that are required for a city to function. Otherwise, you'll have something like a land's great example of Chandigarh, where it's a, it's a beautiful city, very well designed, that has a big slum next to it, which is the only place where you can go to get a good meal because, uh, because there wasn't any room made for the kinds of people who open luncheonettes in Chandigarh. So we, we have to build with that in mind. The solution that we came to at the, um, at the urbanization project, and this is Sally's brilliant idea, which has worked very well, is uh, organizing the peripheries of cities using basic urban expansion plans, mobilizing public sector efforts to address this. Um, in Ethiopia, uh, NYU worked with 18 cities to implement a five step, four steps originally, and I made it five at some point because I found it easier to explain. I apologize for that, Sally. Um, so uh, we, we implemented this to make basic plans for rapid urban expansion at scale. It has five steps. The first step is data, figure out how much the city's gonna grow. The second step is to get your hands on some land that's big enough to actually accommodate this growth. The third step is to um, identify and protect environmentally sensitive areas so that when the growth is happening, you can guide it away from them. You can use these to create public parks, you can use them to create watershed reserves. The fourth step is to grid it, create a network of arterial roads spaced one kilometer apart. Uh, and then the fifth step is to actually acquire the land, take the initial step toward implementation, acquire the land just for the arterial grid. So uh, if there are farmers on this land, they get to stay farmers. If there are villages on this land, they get to stay villages. We're just talking about acquiring the land for the arterial road network before development happens so that in the future, you can actually provide these areas with core infrastructure and services. This is probably the lightest weight planning model in existence and it's worked quite well. Um, so why has it worked well? Uh, because the implementation model is extremely locally led. After receiving some initial training, uh, expansion plans are created by city teams in the public sector. These are teams that I've worked with recently in Uganda. Um, and um, they're led by a local political leader. And this is critical because for urban growth to actually, well, for an urban plan to actually guide urban growth, it has to have political buy-in because eventually someone has to spend money to make it happen. This is in the public sector model. Um, it works because it's based on evidence and data. So we're actually really thinking about where growth is going to take place how much of it, how much land people are consuming per person. We have pretty clear ideas about uh, how to translate that into estimates of growth. And we generate this data with the city team. The city team learns how to produce this data. So rather than simply kind of helicoptering in from New York and giving them a report, um, they build ownership over this because if they do the math, then they trust the numbers. And having confidence in those numbers lets them repeat those numbers. It lets politicians repeat those numbers to the people above them when they're requesting funds. It's, it's very foundational in uh, getting budgets and support. 
Now, once the city has a good idea of how much growth is likely to occur, they make this kind of a basic plan for their expansion area, the land that they'll need to accommodate growth for the next 30 years. And the plan starts with arterial roads, networks like this. And this is no joke. I mean, these, these look really simple. These are actually the plans that people have produced. And um, in this example, no, but in other examples, plans that are this simple have, have been implemented on the ground. You can go there now. You can walk down those roads. People live in the neighborhoods adjacent to them. You know, this, this works. Um, the roads are usually 20 to 30 meters wide. Uh, they're organized in a network that loosely resembles a grid. The idea isn't necessarily to be totally rectilinear, but to make sure that they have four-way intersections and good connectivity across the entire metropolitan area. And the logic here is simply that uh, if you want to maximize productivity in the city, if you want people to have the best shot at having a good life with a good job and the things that they need, then you can't have one big part of the city that's not accessible to the rest. You need to have equity of access. You have to be agnostic about where you're providing services if you want to maximize opportunity. Uh, in the end, it turns out to be a pretty judicious use of resources. These plans only require about 6% of the land in the expansion area. Uh, it's relatively cheap. And because the process is locally led, it's even cheaper. And it's a good, it's a good thing to do because uh, it has short-term actions and long-term impact. The main activity that makes the plans a reality is reserving the land for the arterial roads. Um, the plan is meant to cover 30 years of growth, but the idea is to acquire all the land for the rights of ways of the roads in the first five years, then build them out gradually in response to demand. So what you're really doing is creating um, like a public asset that is a set of road reserves. And if you do it now, you can make a long-term framework for growth. So um, we have data from four cities that started trying to do this in 2014. The first group of four have created over 500 kilometers of arterial roads, either constructed or preserved. And um, city leaders have been able to, to use this uh, to allocate infrastructure funds to actually construct the roads, not just reserve the land. And they report that it's um, reduced informality and squatting, that it's improved revenues. Uh, we conducted a survey which is now being improved with a grant from uh, Open Philanthropy, but the initial survey found that residents uh, living in these serviced expansion areas had were four times more likely to have formal land tenure, four times more likely to have piped water, seven times more likely to have metered electricity. They could get to the city center 35% faster than in areas built at the same time without these arterial grids, and they had a 42% lower travel cost. So um, we're starting to gather data that shows that this approach, when it's implemented, has a real positive impact. So why do these plans work? Well, first off, it's a fundamentally inclusive model. There's nothing about the design that privileges one group over another. There's nothing about it that says it's for high-income people or low-income people or textile factories or anything like that. Second, it's based on evidence and data. It reflects challenges that the cities are actually facing now, people moving to the cities fast, and it provides an approach that can actually be implemented. Because it's simple, it can be locally led, which makes it easy to adapt to local circumstances and embed in the local political reality. So uh, the plans basically offer a realistic approach that governments can, can actually afford, you know, that the public sector can actually afford to do, often with their own resources. Um, and it has a set of short-term actions that can often be accomplished, this is important, within the term of a single mayor, but that produce a visible and long-term impact. This is why it's succeeded. Now, why I think it will succeed in the long term is because it's an evolutionary and adaptive model, fundamentally. So as these cities become wealthier and more populous and their needs change, just like in New York, there's nothing about these grids that locks them into one particular development model they can reinvent themselves still using this backbone. So the question, and this is where I kind of, kind of make like an awkward bridge in the presentation. This is the public sector side of things and it works well, but as I say, um, it, it hasn't fully scaled, right? So the question is, that's maybe relevant to this conference, is how can this mesh with private sector efforts? Because we know that in general, the public sector isn't doing this. In the places where we've gone and we've worked with them, they are, right? But in other places, they're not. And in the end, there's just Sally and me, so 
you know, we can only do so much. Um, the private sector is very eager to be involved in urbanization and urban development in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there are funds that are going into new city projects right now that could pay for dozens of these plans implemented on the ground. Those funds are going to uh, a small, relatively privileged group of people, often in prestige projects. So, so how can we tie this in with private sector efforts? Well, this is a good value for money. We spent around $500,000 to provide knowledge exchange to four cities, created room that we know of for at least 26,000 jobs, 140,000 residents. The actual public sector investment to make these plans in four cities, to make them happen on the ground, was around $10 million. It stimulated $77 million in private investment. So this is where we start seeing the opportunity for arbitrage. A $10 million investment stimulated $77 million in investment, right? So now we start to see how maybe the private sector could start to get involved in this and see something happen. But what's missing from the picture right now, from the way that we've designed urban expansion planning as a public sector-led activity, is a value capture mechanism. Because private companies can't necessarily put a property tax on the edges of cities. So I am just trying to figure this out like recently, but it's very interesting to me, so I'll tell you kind of what I'm thinking and hopefully I'll get some feedback on it. I think that what needs to happen for the private sector to get involved in urban growth at scale on the periphery peripheries of cities is that they need to plan at a more granular level than the grid. They need to go down in the grid. First, they need to plan a grid of neighborhood streets forming blocks and sub-blocks. So they need to further subdivide the land into saleable units. Blocks are a smaller unit of development than macro blocks. Um, but uh, eventually, there's always been an assumption in the back of our minds when we think about urban expansion planning that the macro blocks will be further subdivided eventually, either by the informal sector or by the formal sector. So to capture value from this process, the formal sector would need to lead this process of subdivision of the macro blocks into blocks. There's actually a good argument for doing this. You can develop macro blocks as is. We see it all over the world where uh, a developer creates macro blocks and then sells them off to other developers and, and builds something on it. But uh, when block sizes are too large, the city becomes unwalkable. When too much land is given over to a single development leader, we start to see these cities that are very exclusive. The city becomes very homogenous and dull, like probably almost as dull as looking at a block diagram. Um, and, uh, and this is often the case in new city projects. And the, anado the antidote to this, you know, the antidote to this homogeneity and exclusion uh, is to let as many people participate in the building of the city as possible. Um, so the layout of blocks, like the layout of the macro blocks, should be pretty agnostic as to the uses. And what it means in practice is that block sizes should be designed to optimize for accessibility in general. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on block size. The main thing that I would say is just that um, in young cities and in newly developed areas of cities, land markets are still in flux. So you don't necessarily know what the highest and best use of land is in any given place. So doing boutique block designs, like we see in curvilinear subdivisions, but also like we see in industry parks, um, can foreclose possibilities later because urban layouts are very sticky. So it's better to design a layout, kind of like the Manhattan grid layout, that doesn't uh, presuppose any uses. Um, and that will make this a more adaptable place in the long term. Then, once they have these blocks, they have to create a saleable, a saleable unit. And to do that, that means taking the blocks and subdividing them into plots. And this is really, in some way, the step where there's an opportunity for value capture by a private developer that's seeking to participate in, in actually addressing the challenge of urbanization rather than just building a boutique project. Um, so the, the plots, I have, I have a lot to say about plots. Plot size is a key vehicle for equity in urban development. The smaller the plot size is, the less it costs to buy one. So you can drive the land market down market. You can drive it into the realm of affordability for low-income people if you're willing to make plots small enough. But in Africa in particular, this is often not the case. Formal land subdivision regulations often require plots that are hundreds of square meters, which if you're not a metric person, is way too much land. Uh, it's, it's a lot of land for a house. 
Um, what, what I think developers need to do to tackle this challenge, if they want to get involved in this, is they need to figure out what the smallest plot size is that the local real estate market will bear. And you learn that by looking at what's being sold in the informal sector, where they don't comply with formal plot regulations. And if they can subdivide their land into parcels that are small, then uh, what they do is they make it possible for low-income people to get into those areas and acquire land, and low-income people can compete with wealthier people for spots in those areas because they don't have to pay, even if the square meter price is high, they don't have to buy very many square meters. Regular small plots also, again, try to embed adaptability into the structure. So the underlying subdivision scheme is kind of agnostic about uses. So businesses and residential districts can shift over time without the need for reparcelization. And if you couple this with flexible zoning, small plots allow for the creation of a huge range of housing types and businesses throughout the city. So instead of looking like these, these very homogenous Columbus style developments, what you see is, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. Everyone who sees an opportunity to participate in building the place is able to do so. Uh, you can have small stores, businesses, light industrial, and this is fundamentally more efficient and creates more value because suddenly you have a wide range of people responding to market information. They're more likely to provide what people need. It distributes the task of figuring out what should be built, uh, and it generates a, a big range of jobs beyond core employers. Um, and this is the final thing, uh, the, oh, that didn't work out. So the, the physical framework of the city, of a new city on the edge, or of a new development on the edge, has to be supported with a regulatory framework. And in a new city, or a growth area in particular, uh, this framework needs to be as lightweight and flexible as possible. And again, this is about recognizing that the markets for land and labor are not fully formed. So um, what, I, what, I, what I would like people to think about a little bit is like, what can happen in a block over the course of the life of a city? A block can go, if you haven't seen, this is a really wonderful cartoon by the cartoonist R. Crumb that shows like the evolution of the American landscape. A block can go from being a low density rural area to being a city center, to being an industrial area, to being medium density mixed use. Over the course of decades, it can change dramatically if it's allowed to do so. But what we often do with regulatory frameworks is we lock in uses and prevent that evolution from taking place. So especially in cities that don't have very dynamic zoning models and regulatory models, um, the formal sector investment ends up badly locked in, and the only parts of the city that can actually change and evolve are the informal parts. So you leave a lot of money on the table by not being able to adjust land uses. Now there's still a role for, for zoning in new growth. It just needs to be pretty light zoning. We wanna maximize elasticity in the land market and in the market for floor space. And I think a cool way to do this, which maybe works, maybe doesn't, is to use nuisance controls. Focus on nuisance controls in the early years around sound, traffic, smells, air pollution, and uh, set up monitoring systems for these. They can vary from place to place. I'm, I'm less firm on that idea, so don't jump down my throat on it. But, but in general, the idea is to regulate the externality that you're actually trying to control and to use that as a foundation for how you're growing on the urban edge. Um, and what you're trying to do with that is not necessarily prevent activity from taking place. What you're trying to do is give market signals as to what kind of activity you want that will produce a, a healthier framework in the city. And this is especially critical if you want to have good responsiveness over time. Now, if you do this well, what would happen would be um, private sector investment in land subdivision that would lead to an increase in the number of parcels on the market, plots on the market. And these plots would be sized in such a way that low-income people could acquire them in roughly the same way that they acquire parcels in informal land subdivisions now, except it would be in a framework where you could actually upgrade infrastructure over time. And the private sector could do this because they would capture the increase in value from having serviced and subdivided that land. That would be the idea. So it's a model where you could use private sector funds to, to take that next step in subdivision and create orderly growth on the peripheries of cities. And if it works well, the idea would be to uh, initiate a virtuous cycle, where initially you're doing this subdivision scheme using dirt roads, sorry, I meant to change these pictures, um, where you're, you're initiating this with dirt roads, but as the value increases, as people invest in their housing, as businesses form, 
as more people move to the city, you upgrade the infrastructure, and that in turn stimulates more private sector investment and, uh, and more investment in, um, in public goods. And we know what this looks like when it works well. Like when this is done well, it looks like the very wealthy cities in developed countries where infrastructure was gradually improved over time as the resources available to the public sector allowed it. Um, and it can take place as part of, a, as part of a, a dynamic political process. But the private sector can be the thing that catalyzes it, can make those initial investments, and it can actually work in places where the public sector doesn't. So um, this is what I have to talk about. Uh, the idea is where it's possible, this can be a public sector-led process, where the public sector isn't able to lead this process for various reasons. Um, I think that there's also scope for the private sector to participate in building inclusive, productive cities that actually work for the great mass of people. It just requires them to look beyond the model that they're using right now and in a way to, to think more basic. That's, that's, that's what I think. Thank you.